Uh, Ian Clacker is an Associate Professor in Accountancy and Finance at the University of Leeds, indeed the University of Leeds uh, Business School, and he has been integral to the work uh, of this working party, and we really thank him for his help, uh, and I look forward to his introduction uh, to the paper uh, that you've had a chance to read. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming all along and also for reading the paper, which is quite unusual. Usually, people don't read the paper, so I get to say whatever I want. And I suppose I should do disclaimers first. Anything I say is not a view reflective of these fine gentlemen, nor is it a, reflective, a reflection on the actuarial research centre or the profession. It's the ravings of a lunatic and a madman. And that's possibly not a an unreasonable description of this because it is such an enormous area. And actually, when I was thinking about what to say, the first thing that came to my mind was this. And there's a number of metaphors tied up in this. One is, that's my career. <laughs> it's a road that's going somewhere, but it's very unclear where. But it's also how I've started to think about this as a problem because economics is absolutely huge. And they're all, they're, there are a myriad of different approaches, views, disciplines, and so on and so forth. And actually trying to pull it together is almost impossible. And because of that, this has been hugely fun for me in some sort of really sadomasochistic way. Because actually trying to understand this and think about economics in general is quite a challenge. How it applies to actuaries when I'm not an actuary is even more difficult. So I've spent a lot of time... I also think I might be the recipient of the behavioural economics money as well for another project. So it's a bit worrying that your economic hopes are tied up here. But essentially, thinking about it for the profession is interesting because I've worked with the profession for want of a better description or hung about with actuaries for the better part of a decade. It's because they're really smart. And I'm not saying this because you're all in the room and I'm being recorded and I might want more money from the profession. It's because it's true. And so it's then really quite difficult to think about such a large issue for people who are exceptionally bright and very quantitative, when I'm not that big a fan of the quantitative side for lots of reasons. So the overview, I suppose, is how I, I think <laughs> I was spotted. And I was at the Association of Consultant Actuaries Conference, I think in January 2017, and... The, the presentation was something like alternatives to gilts plus discount rates. And so it was done with a friend of mine who's called Marcus Hurd. He's an actuary. He's the reason I, I get involved with the profession. And we'd, we sort of do little presentations every so often because it's interesting. We like to work together. And it's also a good excuse to go and meet up. And we went and did this. And we get, we get an email saying, just to let you know, we've had to move your session, which is normal, except they had to move it into the main hall. 170 actuaries came to listen to us instead of the usual seven. And so we thought, wow, we might, we might have hit on something here. There might be something interesting. So I very, very quickly cut Marcus aside so I could get all the credit if it was going to be interesting and let him go back into industry and do what it is he does. And I get a phone call from Alex eventually to say, well, we're looking... I actually get an email first from the general email from the profession, but I get a phone call from Alex that said, I quite liked what you said. It says it, it chimes a chord, and we'd be quite interested in an application from you. We're getting applications from other people, but we've been, I've, I've been told you have not applied yet, and I said, no, I've not. I said, why not? I says, I'm quite busy. He says, well, we'd appreciate it. So I decided I would apply, but I applied with the level of bluntness that I had at the ACA, so I didn't think I would get this. And so over the course of getting it, I've essentially got to speak to actuarial royalty. David Wilkie is here, and he's named in the paper with his attributions. So it was great. I went to David's house for tea, and we talked for about three and a half hours about statistics and not about this, and I had to have a follow-up call with him to actually do the work for the project. So I'm almost like a voyeur in all of this, talking to all these people and trying to absorb all this information. And so the whole thing's been interesting for me in that, that respect. And as a way of introducing this, I've got these four bullet points. So the project is 
trying to understand how economics interacts with actuarial practice. And I've got my first point, which is from social science to pseudoscience. And actually, that's because economics, over the past 60 years, roughly speaking, has become progressively more quantitative, much more, more fixated on data, much more fixated on modelling, and arguably less about trying to understand what's going on. And this was a quote that came out of an interview with somebody, and it's referred to in the report. It's a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. And the fundamental question that one should always try and answer is what is it we think is going on? And so you can't really do that with data. It helps, but it's not the be-all and end-all because the world is so complex. So actually, almost by accident, the way in which you get to that is the way in which this project has been done, which is by going and talking to people. And while that's not possible for the profession as a whole, nor is it likely to happen in academic economics, there is definitely value to it. And so when I look at this and I think about it, I'm coming at it from this view of trying to understand that, and I never really understood that's what interested me, but it is. And so when I then look at economics as it used to be, and you think about sort of great thinkers in economics, Adam Smith, Ricardo, Keynes, Hayek, all of these people might have had very, very different political persuasions. Some would be viewed as, as being on the left, some would be viewed as being on the right, but they were all fundamentally trying to understand what's going on. And then something changed and it was roughly 1954 it started to change, which was the development of Markovitz and portfolio theory, which has been phenomenally powerful. Phenomenally powerful. Very, very useful. And so that, it's important to always emphasise this. This isn't a diatribe in a sort of shooting down of what we currently have, but it's trying to make people think more deeply about what we do have and how we push things forward. So when you read things by Adam Smith, by Ricardo, by Keynes, by Hayek and all these other people, it was much more of a social science. And then as we move into portfolio theory and we go through that evolution in economics and in finance, the quantification of this the generation of data through markets and prices, the ability to use computers to do ever more complex forms of analysis, that pushes us to a world where we think less. And the reason I say it's a world where we think less is I used, I used to, up until very recently, run the PhD programme at Leeds in accounting and finance. And one of the biggest frustrations that you have when you do that is it's dead easy to get data, it's dead easy to get a clicking point programme for statistics without ever thinking about those underlying fundamentals. What is it that's driving that data? Because that data is only a reflection of something else that you're not looking at. And that lack of thinking, I think, is now far too commonplace. So what is it that can be, allowed, what, what is it can be done to start to get people to think more about that what's going on question? And I suppose my example, within the profession, there's always a, a narrative and a story which, and I know Andrew's here, but Exley met in Smith, 1997, financial economics comes in and we've never looked back since. And then you've got the people who lament days gone by and people who think the people lamenting the days gone by are just out of touch and then you get this almost schism within the profession. And actually financial economics had a massive input into much of what goes on some of it good, some of it bad but in part my feeling is there is a, a lack of critical analysis of it because it has its role in its place and it comes down to this idea of the economics toolbox. So over that arc of economic theory and financial theory we had something that really could be defined as physics envy and if you read the right papers, even by the great and the good of financial economics, they acknowledge, okay, so John Cochrane, if you know your asset price, and John Cochrane in a review paper says that the great hope was economics would be tractable like physics, and it's not. And so even somebody who is Chicago, I think it's Chicago School Economist, acknowledges that that goal that was, was sort of arrived at in the 50s, 60s and 70s never came to fruition because it's too difficult. So you get to that pseudoscience but the idea that it could be tractable in some way and the belief that it is. And that gets us to this idea about the economics toolbox. So economics is that, it's only tools and financial economics is one of those tools and it's useful. 
And my example that I always come back to for this is the nudge unit. And so the nudge unit was set up by David Cameron, I think in 2012, but it was around that time anyway. And that's because there'd been a book written called The Nudge. And all of a sudden, all these policy makers found out about behavioural economics. It's not like it had already been given a Nobel Prize for prospect theory. And so what you're looking at is, to actually really utilise the toolbox, you've got to read all the books. You can't be like government, because government doesn't read all the books. It reads one of the books, and it captures the zeitgeist. And that's, that is arguably what happened with aspects of financial economics. So when you get to this... And my background is largely pensions, so my, my, my knowledge of insurance is, to, to say it's a little more limited is an understatement, but there is something in common with both. And when we think about the systems that we see today, one of the things that emerged in the, over the course of the interviews, and also something that I have witnessed within the, the profession and actually other aspects of financial services, is people always say, but it's the regulation. And that regulation, if you take something like TPR, is based off, roughly speaking, some version of financial economics. And what's very, very interesting for me, because I've been doing it long enough, is to watch how that narrative changes. And so actually, if you to go back five, six, seven years, that narrative wasn't fungible in any way. It was fixed. And so actually the way in which the regulation has evolved is it went from a completely different regime to a financial economics regime to a hard financial economics regime. We've then seen some unintended consequences of that and it's sort of morphed back in some other way. And, it's that, and for me, I found the circularity interesting. So people would say, oh, there's problems, but it's the regulation. Well, there's an interesting thing about regulation, which is it's not fixed. Regulation shouldn't be the master, it should be the slave. And so there are opportunities whereby one can think about and criticise regulation, can try and improve regulation. And just now it feels to me, and this is my view and nobody else's, that there is something about the current regulatory environment that is counterproductive. And the big question for me is how does one then change that? How should pensions be regulated for them to be long term and provide benefits to people in retirement? How should insurance be regulated for it to be a long term player in markets? And so the final thing is this idea of evolution and not revolution. Depending on when I write that, I change it round if I'm feeling particularly belligerent. But I think in the context of this, what this group for me is trying to do, and I'm sure everybody will either agree or shoot me down, is how does this evolve for the profession? How can the profession take more from economics, be more involved in the thinking around economics as it applies to what goes on in pensions and insurance? How are actuaries trained to give them that broader perspective? And so how can you then make this evolve to be something that's more productive? And I think that's me. Great. Thank you.